So uh, I was running Bain San Francisco office and probably feeling too full of myself. I was in late 20s, I, I think, something like that. And I'm running this office with over 100 people, and it's exciting. I've got this panoramic view of the San Francisco Bay and 34th floor of um, Barcadero Tower number mm -hmm. one. You're Bain's a big a, deal. I'm a big deal. Bain's a hot company. Mm -hmm. I'm just way too full of myself. I don't know it at the time, but I think I probably am. Mm -hmm. And one day I have a, a young partner come into my office. And she comes in and says, Tom, I want to give you feedback. I think, oh, okay. I, you know, I'm trying to be open to feedback, but I was busy. I, you know, she says, no, I really want to give you feedback. So part of me says, well, okay, I got to do this. So you know, she goes up to the board and draws a little picture, and she drew a picture of a steamroller. It was, I didn't actually know it was a steamroller. It just looked like this kind of boxy thing. Mm -hmm. But it was a steamroller. And she said, Tom, my feedback is you're a steamroller. Mm. I thought, Not a good this thing. doesn't sound like a compliment. <laughs> no. What's going on? She said, you're rolling over people. You're being mm. too controlling. You're, you're, you're forcing. And I, and I was thinking, this person is a brand new partner. I mean, it took a lot of courage a for lot her of to courage. say that. And what in the you. world is she doing here? And, you know, with any negative mm. feedback, you first resist it. Mm -hmm. But constructive negative feedback, well-intentioned feedback, mm -hmm. is a gift. And this was a gift. And I went away and thought about that. And I thought, darn, she's right. <laughs> I am being too aggressive. I am being too pushy. I've got mm -hmm. to back off. It's a partnership. Mm -hmm. I've got to nurture people. And the next day, I went back and told her, I said, you're right. And that, that was Meg. Meg. I said, Meg, you're right. That was Meg Whitman, who went on to be the you know, phenomenal chief executive of eBay and is mm -hmm. just an outstanding leader. And so there's an illustration of me trying to do what's right, even despite mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> accepting feedback, kind of despite my resistance. And you know, years later, I was privileged to be asked to go on Meg's board and have been serving there for years. Mm. And who would have uh, thought <laughs> that this, you know, young partner at Bain & Company, that was a strong partner, but one of many, many partners, would go off and do such great things? Mm -hmm. You just don't know. You just don't know in life. So it's, you don't... I don't think you treat people well because you think you're going to get something back for, from it. Mm -hmm. Quid pro quo. Uh -uh. It's not about quid pro quo. It's about doing what's right. Mm -hmm. And if you just try to do what's right, that's the thing that pays dividends. Live a life trying to do what's right. Be conscious of doing what's right. And you're not going to succeed. At least I'm not going to succeed. You make all kinds of mistakes. But if in general you try to do what's right, do right by other people, mm -hmm. that comes back to you. Now, most people would want to follow that advice and, and to, to live that way. Um, and you've talked about, in, in other settings, about how you have to really be disciplined about that. So why is it that we don't see more people really struggling and, and uh, succeeding in grappling with what is right for them and, and pursuing the path that is most meaningful to them and, and the life they're bound to lead? You know, uh, first, I don't know. I, I can only hype hypothesize. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll hypothesize. Um, I know my own journey has been a journey of, of reflection and learning. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I can even begin to articulate some of these things here today is that I've learned them. I didn't know them. I mean, the, the, from the start. The, I, I definitely didn't know them from mm -hmm. the start. I couldn't, have, I couldn't have said this 20 years ago or maybe even 15 years ago. So, so part of the answer to your question may be that these things have to be learned. You have to learn who you are. You have to learn what, what values you bring to the world. You have to ask yourself the tough questions. Mm -hmm. You know, Einstein has this phrase that questions are more important than answers. And mm -hmm. again, I didn't understand this for years because we're taught in school that, boy, you better have answers. It's not about getting the right question. You don't mm -hmm. get points for saying this is the right question. You get all, all your points are for the answers. Mm -hmm. And you get a job and nobody's, no boss is giving you points for raising questions. They're giving you points for getting things done, mm -hmm. for answers. Mm -hmm. In life, the questions matter more. So mm -hmm. questions like, how do I lead a successful life? What is success for me? How important is money? How important is family? How do I want to treat people? How do I think about my reputation? What do I want to be known for? So just well, asking those questions. Well, go ahead. Asking those questions over and over and over again because it is a process of discovery. That's the discipline. That's the discipline. Well, there are two forms of discipline. One form of discipline is asking the questions, mm -hmm. the right questions. Okay? There, are, there are questions that might feel right at any time, like how do I earn money to get, buy a bigger BMW? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, some people will ask that question. More power to them. That may not lead you to the same position you'd want to be in 20 years from now, but maybe it will. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. But what are the central questions to your life mm. and how you ask them and coming back to them, saying, how am I doing? That's one kind of, that's one kind of discipline. The other kind of discipline is then acting on your answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where it gets pretty hard. Because on one hand, you might say, you know what, I want to have... I want to have a really uh, robust family life. I want my kids to know me. I want to be there and help them. I want to go to that little league game. I, I want to. I want to be part of their lives. Mm -hmm. I want. I want them to be my friends when they're. You know, when they're off and starting their own family. I want to. I want to have a relationship with them. I don't want it to be. Yeah, you know, dad's out there someplace or mm -hmm. mom's out. So, you know, that requires trade-offs. That requires discipline to make decisions about how you spend your time, about what your priorities are at any point in time. And, and so this issue of discipline manifests itself two ways. Asking the right questions, kind of disciplined inquiry. Mm -hmm. What do I want my life to be? How am I doing? What can I do better? What are my strengths I can build on? All of that stuff. And then at the same time, what does that mean for what I do and don't do? The choices. Your choices. What about do I say no to? Where you allocate your time and attention... And what you don't do. It, it, I so think in the general, in general, the most underused word when it comes to building a successful life is the word no. It's the most underused word. We're, we're trained to say yes. Hmm. You know, I'm going to do that homework assignment, and boy, I'm going to I'm going to do extra point. I'm in extra points. You know, it's a can do. I've got a can a do yes attitude. A lot of yes. A lot of yes. You got to have yes. Mm -hmm. It's like one strong arm. You've got to have yes. Mm -hmm. Yes without no deals a killing blow to the individual. <laughs> well, it's like an accelerator without a brake. Yes. You can't drive without a brake. You, you can't drive without a brake. So you have to say, I'm doing this, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. And the more you can think about those decisions, the more you can make those explicitly, and they're usually tactical. We think about the big decisions. Okay, we talked about bridge span. Do I help start bridge span or not? That's mm. one of those large binary decisions. And those have enormous implications, so they can. Yeah, but you had smaller iterations of that Lots, earlier, exactly. right? So I, you know, I focus a lot on small wins and experiments that are designed to better align your actions with your values. And, and so you, there are exactly steps right. you were taking earlier that helped you to see that this was a, a path that you could pursue. But Absolutely. I was, I was, it is exactly that. It's all about the small things, not the big things. The big things look bigger than they really are, mm -hmm. and the small things are more important than they really seem. Because mm -hmm. it's those little trade-offs. It's back to the life balance issue. It's being sure you take vacations when you've committed to your family. It's in my case, for example, I made a commitment to myself when I started at Bain, I was not going to go into the office on the weekends. And you know, now, did I? Yes. Did I very often? No. How often? In my, how long has it been? Almost 30 years now in business, I would say I've been in the office working on a weekend 10, 15 times. Hmm. Now, now this doesn't unusual. mean I don't read on weekends okay. and do email and so get you, on a phone. There's stuff you do that's work-related, but it's just I'm not doing in it, the office. I'm doing it at home. At home. And how has that affected your performance? It's made it better. <laughs> ah. It's made it... You know, one of the great so that's ironies... that's a paradox, Tom. How do you explain that? Well, there's, there is. There Less is, work, better performance? I don't get it. Um, I'm not an athlete, but let's think about an athletic okay. analogy. Uh, would, you tr would you tell an athlete, if you're coaching an athlete, would you tell that athlete to train 12 hours a day, 7 days a week? Would you say, you're going to be better if you train over and over and over mm -hmm. again? Just flat out. 12 hours a day, seven days a week, then go to sleep, eat your dinner and go to sleep. Now, or would you more likely tell the athletes, you know what, you have to have cycles because you mm -hmm. need periods of recovery. Sure. We all need periods of recovery. We need to sleep. We need to relax. We need to clear the system out. We are more effective athletes mm -hmm. if... Our life is a cycle, and if there are different dimensions to that cycle. Or musician, or any kind of performing art, right? Any kind of performing art. Well, it turns out, as near as I can see, that's the answer to your paradox. So, for example, I have more energy 
by exercising. Me too. Okay. So how often do you exercise? Daily. Me too. I exercise every day, except periodically when I have really early flights and things like that, and I can't. <laughs> but I probably, I'm probably five to six days a week average. Uh-huh. That use of an hour creates more than an hour's worth of energy. I understand. I am more alert. I'm making better decisions. Yep. There's a quality dimension to this and a quantity dimension. It's not the hours you work. It's the impact you have during the hours you work. Right. It's just like the athlete. It's not how many hours you train. It's the consequence of the training mm-hmm. in your ability to compete. It's the same thing here. Yep. So the paradox is it feels like at any point in time more work is always better. That's when the, the dominant, reality is, yeah. sometimes more work is a lot worse. And oftentimes more work is a lot worse. Mm-hmm. Because in fact, if the more work is coming at the expense of recovery, health, family, other elements that kind of nurture yourself, that make you more able to compete, mm-hmm. if it's coming at the expense of that, it'll hurt you. It sure. may not hurt you right away. It, it, I ran a marathon once, one marathon. So this is one of these things, you know, some people do this a lot. My brother ran 90 marathons. Whoa. I ran one. Yeah, he, he, he's pretty intense about it. I ran one. I ran the Boston Marathon before you had to qualify for it, because <laughs> I could not possibly do it today. Uh-huh. But I, what, I learned, what I learned is that the key success factor to finish the marathon was, not surprisingly, pacing. Mm-hmm. And people who sprinted out, and I was, I don't, let's say I was running seven and a half minute miles, you know, the guy who sprinted out running six and a half minute miles, who's kind of like me, didn't make it. They burn out. They burn out. Mm-hmm. It feels really good at about mile three. Mm-hmm. Feels really good. Feels okay at mile kind of eight. Mile 14, it's not feeling good at all. It's right. feeling really bad. That's pain. That's pain. Mm-hmm. It's pacing. And so, again, so if you're able to, to lead organizations, well, just thinking about both Bridgespan and, and, and Bain for, for a moment, have you been able to, in addition to kind of being a model for that sort of discipline and, uh, and enacting your sort of daily, weekly, monthly life using that sort of uh, framework, have you been able to instill in others the same kind of idea? I, I hope so. I, I, I hope so. Uh, but because I, but it's I'm easier not, the higher you get, right, in an organization. We have more freedom, more discretion, less, less kind of daily pressure to deliver. Well, it's true, but the irony is uh, the higher you go in an organization, you do have more degrees of freedom, but it looks like you have more responsibilities as well. Mm-hmm. Looks so, like? It looks like it, the self, the experience is, yes, I have more degrees of freedom, mm-hmm. but my God, there's only one chief executive. And if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Right. And all roads ultimately lead to me. And therefore, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I've got to work even harder. So whereas if you're junior in the organization, you have fewer degrees of freedom. But you know what? You know, if you mess up a little bit, it's not the, board's the not end of the world. After you. <laughs> the board's not coming after you. So there's this this dual set of tensions, Mm -hmm. think the reality is at every stage in life, we have more degrees of freedom than we think we have. Mm -hmm. And where people get in trouble is where they feel like they're victims, where they feel like, you know, I'm a prisoner in a set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, are there, do do companies go through tough times? Sure. Do jobs go up and down? Sure. Do you have a new job and it's really hard and you're still high in learning curve? Of course. Mm -hmm. But over times, over time, over any span of time, we are masters of our own destiny. We are not victims. We are in charge. It is our life. We own it. We make choices. We decide what to do, what to double down on, what not to do. We make choices mm-hmm. that influence us. So at any, you know, for any given month or quarter, you can say, oh, my gosh, I had to do certain things that boy, I didn't really want to do. But over time, uh-uh, uh-uh. It's up to the individual to make the trade-offs in his or her life consistent with the kind of life she or he wants to have. And how did you deliver that message in a way that people actually heard it in, in your, as CEO of Bain or presently in, in uh, your role at, uh, at Britspan? Uh, I, th- I think and hope I deliver it in multiple ways. Mm-hmm. I, I role model it certain ways. But I'm also pretty consistent in my messaging and have been for a long time. 